Hey, Keith, I'm so excited today. You are going to set the stage for the rest of the course by telling us all about the brain and why we're interested in ultrasound modulating the brain. I'm glad you're so interested, Kim, and I'm excited too. And I think this goes hand in hand with Kim's fundamental lecture on ultrasound physics. Um, you need to really understand the brain and the ultrasound to put the two together, right? So in this lecture, we're covering uh, the basics, which you've probably seen in some introductory biology courses, but we're going to try to sort of wrap them together here. And we're going to go over neuroanatomy. That's the architecture of the brain at different scales, resting membrane potential, how the how individual neurons hold charges. Um, and we go into the active and sort of passive methods that they do that by. We're also going to look at signal transmission. So how different neurons send signals from one to the next. And because this is an ultrasound neuromodulation course, I wanted to start by asking the question at the bottom here of what makes neurons different from each other when you think about all these features. And if they are different from each other, how would mechanical forces differently affect these systems? So as we walk through this, try to imagine ultrasound passing through all of these little bits and, and how that might alter everything. And I'll just note that this is a really conceptual lecture. I'm trying to give you sort of a feel for, for the neuron and the brain. Uh, but if you want something that's a little more circuit and mathematical modeling heavy, uh, Steve Backus did an excellent, excellent lecture with us last semester, uh, which is on our, our YouTube account. Yeah, that would be a good one to look at, I think, after this one, since you're going to give us a good overview. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So I'll just jump in. Let's start with what the neuron is. So the neuron looks a lot like other cells in the body. It has the fundamental components that, that are important for cell function, like the, the body itself or the main housing, the nucleus with all the genetic information that makes the cell what it is, uh, the ER and the Golgi apparatus important for protein modifications and so on. The mitochondria or sort of the, the powerhouse of the cell is responsible for generating ATP. These are little energy molecules in the cell. And while that's important for every cell in the body, it's intriguing for neurons because while they only make up about 2% of the weight of the whole body, they actually consume around 20% of all its energy. So uh, it's very energetically consumptive, if that's even a word, uh, organ. <laughs> Okay, so what makes these different from other cell types? Well, let's start with these little extending branches off the cell body here. So these are called dendrites and the finer processes are called dendritic branches. Sometimes they're called arborizations because they look like uh, little tree limbs. And these structures are responsible for reaching out to other neurons nearby and receiving information. And we'll get into what that information looks like later. And on the other side of the cell body is something called an axon. So these don't always look so long as they are here, but, but sometimes uh, they'll travel quite far away. And what they do is send information out of the neuron cell body. And the axon hillock here, that's kind of an old term. Um, it, it refers to a section of the neuron that integrates and is responsible for its activation. Uh, people now more commonly refer to it as the axon initial segment, which actually extends more into this region here. And we'll talk about that later. And as you get way down these axonal processes, the cell starts to arborize again onto either a single neuron or sometimes even thousands of other neurons, even though I, I didn't show them here. And these are uh, often referred as telodendria or synaptic terminals. And we'll zoom in on these later as well. So, so an overview is that the neuron is an information carrying cell type um, that, that receives information and sort of sends it out to other similar uh, cells. Keith, wh why does it use so much energy? What is it used for? Are you about to tell us that? Is it because it's less <laughs> self in equilibrium, the, the chemical equilibrium? Okay, I'll, I'll just wait. No, no, it's a great question. We're going to get into it. But in order to send signals, the cell is actually at a higher energetic uh, potential before it does that. And maintaining that potential requires a lot of energy, but we will get there. Okay. So let's jump into, I'll just back up to say at the end of these telodendria are these little regions between uh, dendrites and, and axons uh, called synaptic terminals. So I just want to sort of zoom in on that with these figures here. 
So again, you can see our axons are these green figures or green shapes on the left-hand side, and they meet up with the dendrites of neighboring, uh, neighboring neurons. And these are called synapses where these, these two meet. Um, and this allows, again, information transfer between these two neurons. And when we're thinking about single neurons connecting to others, we often try to simplify or boil down all of these connections in, in something called a circuit diagram, probably not unlike electrical diagrams you've looked at. Now, when you're typically looking at a neuroscience paper, I'll just give you a few conventions that are common. When uh, you see these sort of filled in shapes, these typically represent some sort of cell body. Um, typically triangles are representative of pyramidal neurons. These are neurons usually in the cortex that send long information streams out. And inhibitory neurons that actually shut off their connected uh, cell partners are typically drawn with circles and these little lines sort of representing like I'm blocking this output. And again, Although we're showing just a single sort of cell here, this usually represents tens, hundreds, thousands of neurons, depending on the system you're looking at. But I wanted to show you a schematic that you might see going forward. In reality, uh, you know, it's a lot messier. So this could even be what I just described as sort of one node in the network. But really, it's a bunch of cells that are laterally connected to one another and also send out these long axonal processes shown here. So it's overwhelming, probably even more so to engineers such as yourselves, because like, how are we ever going to quantify such a messy looking thing? And I would say that, that often, yes, the measurements are noisy, um, but technologies are growing rapidly. I actually saw this paper published three days ago where a group claims they were successfully able to image over a million individual cells with high frame uh, rate resolution. And I forget how fast they did it, but here you can see that they're scanning through a z-axis plane of the brain in an alive animal. And every one of these little dots represents a neuron or these little lit up regions here. So there's a lot of information we're able to gather from the brain. And I think the rate of technology is going to enhance the way we observe circuits. Kim's excited. You can see a big smile. She's like, I can't wait to implement this in my lab. <laughs> And she, ha she is implementing a lot of these techniques, I think, even right now. I did have a question on the prior slide because I've heard before about the tripartite synapse. And so I see you have a picture there, the astrocytes right up against your synapse. Mm -hmm. And I should tell the class that Kim has never seen these slides. So she is really asking these questions. And here is the tripartite synapse <laughs> that Kim's referring to. So when we think about the brain, it's not just these electrically uh, conducting sort of information transferring neurons. It's also composed a lot of a cell type called glia. So we have to mention these. They actually uh, compose a large part of the brain. So glia is actually the Greek word for glue because when people originally had seen these structures that were next to neurons shown in green here, uh, they thought they were just there to actually hold the neurons in place and stop them from moving. And as I mentioned, they represent a large portion of the brain, somewhere between 33 and 66%. I mean, it's potentially even more than the neurons themselves. Um, and as I mentioned, they don't actually carry electrical information per se. What they do is serve to support these synapt uh, synaptic areas and the functions of neurons that they sort of mesh around. So uh, Kim, I didn't know if you had deeper questions about the, the tripartite synapse. But I will say with regard to um, this type of glia, these usually serve to recycle and buffer uh, certain molecules that land in the synapse. So they help sort of balance out the connections between two neurons. And these are very common in the mammalian brain. Yeah, could you just tell us just briefly how the um, synapse works? So there's little vesicles there with chemical and they get released and you, you tell. Yeah, that's, that's going to come up way later in the lecture. I don't know. I won't jump immediately to that slide. So we're still on the high level stuff and I'll try to move along here, but there aren't just these tripart synapses, uh, glial cells, you know, there's a lot of them and they, they actually look very diverse when you look at the brain. So just to name a few, there's these epidemal cells, which create a barrier around neurons between uh, the neural tissue itself and the fluid that flows through the brain, which I'll tell you in a second. Um, there's astrocytes, 
So these are involved in the secretion or absorption of uh, neurotransmitters. And, and these are, um, of course, playing a part in these tripartite synapses we just talked about. Uh, there's also microglia, which are a really different type. Those are, are really involved in moving around the brain and collecting garbage and dead cells to keep the brain healthy. And there's also oligodendrocytes, which wrap around neuronal axons and actually allow the electrical conductance to be improved. And we'll talk about that later. So uh, the brain doesn't just have neurons and glia, it also has uh, ventricles. These are giant fluid wells in the brain and vasculature, which refers to blood architecture. So just to give you a sort of rough idea of what ventricles look like, it, it involves the fluid that surrounds the brain. Um, so acting as sort of a cushion in case the brain is, is moving up or down. And also these wells that flow through the middle of the brain um, it, this particular large one is called the choroid plexus, and, and there are others. And these actually flow up from the spinal cord. And you can imagine that when metabolites and, and sort of garbage accumulates in the brain, that it diffuses into this fluid, and that this fluid sort of rinses those uh, metabolites out of the brain. And I think I have all these things listed on the right here. Right, right. So this is cerebral spinal fluid and the choroid plexus actually makes the cerebral spinal fluid. And so it's some, some structures in there um, in, in one of the ventricles. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I didn't actually know where CSF was produced and it might be multi-site. So some of it's in the choroid, it sounds like. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, it, and it's actually interesting when you look on imaging that you can see the choroid plexus shows up really bright on CT pictures. And anyway, you go on. It's very cool. It also relates to, so a, a big point that Kim probably made in the lecture before this is that uh, you get acoustic streaming with ultrasound. And these are huge fluid pockets in the brain. So it's worth thinking about how much these fluids might move in response to ultrasound waves. Kim, thoughts on that? You, you gave a face. I always have to <laughs> chime in. <laughs> but the CSF is really important when we're talking about, you know, uh, impacts on the, on the head because it cushions the brain. Um, and it says so right there on your slide uh, that it, uh, you know, with all this fluid, it gives a, the brain, you know, a, a cushion. Um, so that's really nice because sometimes when we, we talk about ultrasound, we can kind of talk about the sort of the, the pressure. Um, but anyway, we're not yeah, really talking point. about that much pressure. Yeah, that's a really good point, but at least there might be some sort of buffer for that. So let's also talk briefly about vasculature, which ultrasound can uh, do many interesting things with. So this is just basically blood vessels, capillaries, veins, arteries that are in the brain network. And even though most images show just a few large blood vessels, they're actually sort of everywhere in the brain. Um, and an interesting fact, or maybe not a fact, but idea is that you know, if, if something penetrates the brain, it's not necessarily going to kill you because it's damaging neural tissue that will just make your brain operate different. What actually might kill you is, is when these larger blood vessels are disrupted and, and blood flows out into your brain. Um, so again, it's, a, it's sort of a branching network that carries uh, nutrients and molecules to the neurons and nearby tissue. And something that is really interesting, and Kim can tell you a little bit more about what she's doing with this, is that uh, these blood vessels, particularly in the brain, are wrapped very tight by glia, particularly astrocytes, that only allow the transmission of very small uh, nonpolar molecules. And this is called the blood-brain barrier. Uh, Kim, do you want to actually tell us a little bit about what you're doing with the blood-brain barrier? Well, so the blood brain barrier is really important because it protects your brain. It protects it from toxic chemicals from getting out into the brain. Um, but there are some times when you actually want so toxic chemicals out in the brain. For example, if you have somebody with a brain tumor and you want to give them a chemotherapy, then you'd really like to be able to have it get out into the brain. And so the idea here is, can we use ultrasound in some way to disrupt the blood brain barrier so that some large molecules like the chemotherapy can leak out? And so the way that worked, do you want me to say how this works? Keep going. I, I mean, I'd love to hear it. All right. So the way this works is that you can give micro bubbles intravenously, and then they flow up into the brain, and then you apply ultrasound 
And where the focus of the ultrasound is, the bubbles will oscillate. And you can just imagine that right there in that picture, in the middle of the blood vessel, there's this bubble that's oscillating. And it's giving, um, and as it oscillates, it pushes on that endothelial cell. And then that pushes on the parasites and the astrocytes. And they all respond by sort of, um, allowing these big molecules to go across this blood brain barrier. And it was a little vague how I said that allow the molecules to go across because apparently there's like six different ways that molecules or, or, or maybe even more that molecules can get across the blood brain barrier because there's gap junctions and then there's active transport across the cells and all of these methods uh, for getting the large molecules across, they increase their transport when you've got these micro bubbles oscillating. So um, anyway, yeah, so this is just a, uh, an ex one example of opening the blood-brain barrier with, with focused ultrasound and, and micro bubbles, which is not the topic of the course, except we are going to talk about it in one lecture right at the end. <laughs> there is a lecture about this, so <laughs> be prepared to learn even more about this exciting new field. I, and it is gaining a lot of traction, by the way, with, with uh, pharmaceutical companies and, and Kim, of course. So uh, let's let's jump forward to the central nervous system as a whole. I so I talked to Kim about you know how to discuss this, and and really what I would say is you can think about the brain as sort of large compartments of function. So for instance, the frontal lobe is often associated with things like high cognitive decision making. You know, should I go left? Should I go right? Um, whereas when you get to the deeper parts of the brain, it starts to, to give rise to really ancient functions like hunger and fear and breathing. Um, but all of these all of these regions within the brain have multifunction. So it would be really impossible to say that a brain region just does one thing. So I, I would encourage you to think about the multifunctionality. Um, and as I mentioned, the outer layers of the brain are really involved in higher cognitive processing. In fact, these upper cortical layers don't even exist in a lot of invertebrates or less evolved uh, creatures like Drosophila I used to study. You know, they don't have a cortex. And indeed, they can't really make super complex decisions. But you have to ask yourself with ultrasound, depending on what you're trying to do, is this highly complex uh, decision-making organ worth uh, targeting? And sometimes your answer might be yes, sometimes no. Again, these deeper brain regions are, are more higher conserved uh, functions. And then, of course, sending information into the brain from uh, the peripheral nervous system, which I'll talk about, is the uh, spinal cord um, shown here. And Kim, I know you, you asked me to say why we might target certain regions rather than others, but I think we're going to talk about that more in the skulls lecture. And you know, I'll ask you, Kim, like, for me, it would be, well, what do you want to do? What's your, your clinical outcome and which brain region does it? And if there's many and there's one that's easier to reach or it's larger, you know, that might be a good target. But I don't think there's a good answer for this right now. There's a lot of different regions and a lot of different targets and a lot of different conditions that people are thinking about and interested in. So, I mean, at this point, there's kind of, you know, we're interested in all of it. Yeah, so let's, I guess we won't bottleneck you guys to one region or another, but, but keep all of this in mind. And the peripheral nervous system, you know, it's definitely an exciting sector of the body as well, because there's no skull around it for the most part. I mean, if you're talking about vertebrae, there, there's, of course, bone. But for all of these other nerves, they're sort of, uh, you know, it's open season if you want to get ultrasound into there, and, and it's much easier. And the peripheral nervous system really includes everything that is not the spinal cord and the brain. Um, so some key ideas are that this carries all information from outside into the brain. Um, and this could include sensory systems, touch, smell, hearing, all of, all of these uh, functions, um, as well as the enteric nervous system, which we shouldn't forget. So these are the nerve bundles that wrap around the gut and the stomach and the intestines. And some people call this the second brain because there's just so much track material and it has a huge influence on brain state that's been getting way more attention uh, in recent times. In fact, the serotonin released from your gut is thought to play sort of a major role in depression and maybe an indicator as well. There's also uh, other organs that are controlled by this peripheral nervous system, uh, such as the heart and the lungs, and these don't actually require large parts of the brain to function. 
Um, in fact, a lot of these autonomous functioning uh, nervous systems even start with within the spinal cord. So if you remember like the chicken who had his head cut off, he uh, still lived and actually died from choking on a seed. I don't know if that's true, but it sort of points to the idea that there's a lot of self-contained function in these outer nerve bundles. Okay, so let's get to the juicy stuff. Uh, the electrical neuron. So this is all about how a neuron actually communicates uh, information and how it's electrically charged. And the fundamental unit of, of uh, <clears throat> architecture here is the lipid membrane, um, particularly these things called phospholipids. So a phospholipid is sort of a compound that revolves around this phosphate uh, group, which contains ultimately a negative charge you'll see on this oxygen side chain here. And these are connected um, basically through enzymatic action to these long fatty acid chains. So these fatty acid chains can be found in like oils and butters and, and things like that. And in particular, the reason, uh, well, I'll get to this in a second, but you can see here that there's a double bond between uh, one of these chains. And this actually causes a chink in this long carbon chain. And because of this kink, the interaction between these molecules is a little pushed out. So if these were really densely packed, the fluid membrane might not be so fluid. But because of this kink, every neuron has this membrane that can sort of move and, and act almost in like a fluid manner. And Scott Hansen last year talked a lot about how the membrane is a fluid. And depending on how many molecules or uh, cholesterols and proteins are in the membrane, they may be more or less fluid. And I want you to keep that in mind as we move forward in the course. Now, because of this charge, this negative charge here, and the lack thereof of charge in this long sort of lipid tail, uh, these, these molecules organize with a negative charge facing outwards. And the uh, likes here, uh, these, these fatty acid chains actually organize together in sort of the center. So you get this sort of bilipid membrane is, is what they call this. And this organization is self-aggregating. So if you just put, let's say like oils in a, you know, in a dish or something, the water outside would be attracted to these negative charges. And so the tails would organize together. But here I'm showing you a cross section of what this membrane looks like. In reality, it's this sort of large three-dimensional structure and it's full, it's jam-packed with other molecules besides the phospholipids themselves, which here are shown in this light 10. And some molecules that are included and we'll talk about later are cholesterol. So the more cholesterol there is in the membrane, the more rigid the membrane is. Wait, what there is cholesterol? Iron. What is cholesterol? Yeah. So cholesterol is another type of lipid chain molecule and whether or not it has substantial charge, I don't remember. Um, but it's basically a chain molecule that sort of organizes through the membrane and, and is bound to the sort of inner side. Um, when we think about cholesterol, I think we often think about like heart clogging and artery clogging. And that's because when it's flowing through the bloodstream, it can aggregate against the arterial membrane wall. Um, and that's sort of another uh, idea, but they are also found in the membrane itself. There are molecular transporters, so uh, different molecules can move across the membrane. And there are lipid rafts, which I won't even talk about now, but the, those are, uh, as Kim mentioned, sort of these cholesterol aggregates that, that perform a function that, again, I won't get into right now, but uh, it's very oh, exciting. Oh, this is so exciting though. Um, so is it the cholesterol that makes it less fluid, the, those parts of the membrane? So, uh, I, God, I won't comment too much on this. Uh, I would say possibly, but they are part of a molecular system that aggregates and doesn't look like the rest of the membrane. Okay. Because if it was homogenous with the membrane, it would spread out. But instead, there are these bundle rafts that look like each other. And when you disrupt them, uh, that causes really interesting things to happen. And I'll just, I'll blow a little secret here, but ultrasound can disrupt these rafts and do really fun things. Uh, so we think anyway. <laughs> 
One of the things that's always very interesting to me is that if you take an MR picture, then the middle of the brain doesn't ever look as if it has any lipids in it on an MRI. Like you don't get any chemical shift in the middle of the brain, even though there's all this lipids that you've just been telling us about. And, you know, my understanding is that those lipids, since they're sort of um, aggregated that way, that they have really short T2s and they look kind of like solid in an MRI sense, um, but they are fluid from a biologist sense. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Scott calls them fluid. I, I yeah, think it's yeah. hard to imagine them as a total fluid, maybe more like a waxy, oily hybrid or something. But because they're so packed together that they give off um, uh, energy to each other very quickly and have very short T2s. And so on an, from an MRI standpoint, they're not there. So they, they're invisible. Very interesting. Yeah. They don't look like the water in the surrounding area. So if I haven't said this already, and I don't think I have, the membrane is very impermeable itself to charged molecules. Um, as we mentioned, the blood-brain barrier is like also difficult to get charged molecules through. So stuff doesn't easily cross this, and that's why we need these ion channels and molecular transporters, and those will come into play later. Uh, I wanna talk about a principle that's going to guide electrical charge here, and that is the electrochemical gradient. So what is a chemical gradient? That is the idea that molecules move from a high to low concentration. And this hasn't always made sense to me. It makes sense to Kim, but molecules really only care about their own concentration. Oh, I so, know. This, this is... This is, you know, Stanford right now is fragrance free, which means you're uh -huh. not allowed to wear like all this cologne. But um, if you were to wear a lot, a lot of cologne and go into the room, then suddenly, you know, that cologne would like, you know, diffuse through the room. And so that's, a, that's what you're talking about here. I mean, yeah, let's, in fact, let's pretend that these are perfume molecules on the left here. <laughs> if, if there's more of them on the left and this interface is totally permeable, they want to move to the right. And indeed they will. Even if, here's, here's the interesting part, even if there's other molecules that are the same size that lead to an equal uh, number of things. So even, even if it looks like this, the white, will, the white molecules here will still wanna move to the right, which again, it baffles me a little bit, but you know, that's, that's what happens. So that's the chemical gradient and the perfume in the room, if you're going with uh, Kim's <laughs> sort of metaphor there. And there is also an electrical gradient in this sort of two-part equation. And that simply states that molecules will move towards the opposite uh, charge or opposite net charge. So in this scenario on the right-hand side, the positive molecules want to move, they wanna to move towards this positive sign. They wanna to move towards these negative ions and vice versa. The negative ions want to move towards the positive. So these may, in some scenarios, be competing interests, but I want you to know that they both exist together. Now, in these two scenarios, you know, these, these things may move, but what happens when the membrane dividing these two compartments is not completely permeable or only permeable to certain molecules? So I'm just going to give you a little diagram here. Imagine that we have sodium and chloride ions. So sodium uh, cations, which have a positive charge and chloride anions, both of them have a very low chemical concentration on the right. And so the chemical gradient would want these uh, molecules to move to the right. I think we would all agree. And in a perfect world, if, well, I don't know if it's a perfect world, but if there was a perfectly permeable membrane, then these molecules would move until the concentration on the left equaled the right. But in neurons and in biology, this is very rarely the case. So let's say the membrane was only permeable to sodium ions. So if we only looked at concentration gradient, then our, our sodium ions should move until there were three ions over here and three ions over here. That's our perfume analogy. It should be balanced, right? But because chloride ions are not moving across their own concentration, gradient, we now have a net negative charge on the left-hand side. And as I mentioned, there's a wantingness of voltages to come towards each other. So if the net negative charge exists over here, that's actually going to pull in this direction from right to left on the sodium ions. 
so that the concentration gradient is never fully fulfilled. Um, and this sort of balance between concentration and voltage gradients is something that really creates differentials across a neuronal membrane. Kim, I don't know if I did a crappy job of explaining that or if that no, was- No, that's okay. good. That I can see where sense. you're going because you're going to set us up here with um, ion channels that are selective. Yep, set, setting myself up for the spike here. <laughs> so, so the question might be uh, that arises here is, what is the required voltage to offset this concentration gradient? Can we somehow derive this? Because again, I told you, you need a negative charge over here to stop this concentration gradient from, from becoming balanced. And you can actually use something called the Nernst equation to explicitly derive the voltage required to, to meet that concentration gradient. And here you can see uh, some constants. So, so we would call that balance the equilibrium voltage. So we're trying to derive a voltage here. And involved in this equation is a gas constant. So that is R and that sort of involves uh, diffusive forces on molecules and temperature, which you know, allows diffusive forces to act differently. We typically use, uh, I guess, the temperature in a biological system, which is about 310 degrees Kelvin. Some people use room temperature. Um, and then of course there's ion valence. So that is simply, is it a single charge? If it is, you know, if it's a sodium cation, that's plus one. It's a chloride ion, uh, anion, that would be negative one. And then you would take the natural log of your uh, concentration outside a membrane or outside a divider versus inside a divider. So let's go ahead and plug some values in and, and see how this would work in practice. So uh, let's just have, you know, let's run that question back or, or for a different uh, sort of system here. At what voltage would a potassium ion stop moving down this concentration gradient? So here you can see I have 100 millimolar potassium on one side on the inside of this membrane. It really, really wants to move down its concentration gradient where the other side is only five millimolar, a very small fraction of that. So how much negative voltage would I need on the inside to stop these potassium ions from flowing from left to right here? So again, we can plug in uh, our constants and those usually solve out to 61.5. If we uh, multiply out our Faraday constant by our ion valence, uh, we're getting plus one and we're taking the natural log of our five millimolar um, outside over our 100 millimolar inside. And as you run this calculation out, you get an equilibrium potential for this particular system at negative 80 millivolts. Okay, so that's sort of a basic of how to, how to calculate that equilibrium potential for a single um, ion type. So let's get back to the neuron itself. Wait, Keith, um, I'm missing a part. Can you explain how do we set up that voltage across the cell membrane? That's a great question, Kim. So I, I can, but I will even start by, I guess that, well, I'll answer it straight by saying, you know, what is it that actually makes that inside more negative than positive? And I'll begin by saying there is a differential between ions of certain types. So although there are a lot of ions in the cell beyond this, uh, some of the major players in establishing this charge are sodium, potassium, chloride, and calcium. And as you can see by the scale of each one of these items, there's a lot more sodium outside of the cell than there is inside. And there's a lot less chloride inside and, and so on. And in, in fact, we have uh, some of the earliest measurements of these concentrations from the giant squid axon. And here you can see that this positive ion potassium is very in, uh, high inside the cell, whereas sodium is extremely high outside and so is uh, chloride. And, and that's sort of the initial uh, aspect of creating this negative charge. It's just these differences in intracellular and extracellular concentrations. Wait, I'm, I'm not following you. So there are different concentrations because there's a mechanism to make a difference in concentration. It's not like it naturally occurs this way. That's right, that's right. And let's even jump right into those mechanisms that make these differences in charges happen. 
And the first one you'll always hear about, you've probably already heard about this uh, in some intro courses you've taken, is the sodium potassium ATPase. So this is a really interesting um, channel because it actually uses energy to fight the gradient that ions want to move down. So um, the, the pump, basically the sodium potassium ATPase uses a single ATP molecule, which is uh, the, the cell's energy molecule I mentioned earlier, to move three sodium ions outside of the neuron while exchanging that for two potassium ions. And it will do this continuously as long as there's ATP around irrespective of the concentration gradient or the voltage. So it uses energy to actively fight what the membrane would do otherwise. And, and this is a huge player in creating a negative charge inside the cell because we've only moved in this sort of system, we've only moved two positively charged ions in, but we've moved three out, giving us a net negative charge of negative one for every exchange here. So again, you know, this fights sort of what is natural to the cell and begins to create an electrical gradient across the membrane. But at the same time, it's creating a chemical gradient, particularly uh, for potassium, because there is now much more potassium inside the cell. And for sodium, if we we're just looking at sodium, the chemical gradient would be in the other direction. Um, but the electrical gradient here is sort of uniform to all ions. So uh, another important player in establishing this difference is also the potassium leak channel. So I mentioned that because there is now more potassium ions inside the cell than there is outside because of this active mechanism, if we listen to our rules about concentration, potassium ions want to go out of the cell and the negative charge in the membrane may hold them, but the concentration gradient is actually more powerful um, in, in this sort of equation. And so potassium moves outside of the cell. And this actually increases the negative charge inside the cell even further, because we're losing even more positive ions now. So we can use the Nernst equation as we did earlier to ask ourselves, how much voltage do we have to have inside the cell to stop these potassium channel or these potassium ions from going down their chemical gradient? Because the electrical uh, negative charge inside the cell wants to keep the potassium ions in. And when you do the equation out, that ends up being something like negative 70 millivolts. So there are, are a lot of other uh, channels within the membrane that are also sort of playing a role in here. And I'm not going to go into great detail on them, but I would sort of mention a few. Apologies for these little scraps I left down here. One of them is the sodium leak channel. So it operates the same as the potassium leak channel. It essentially allows sodium to leak uh, in whatever way it wants. So in this case, there's both an electrical and chemical gradient pulling these sodium ions into the cell. So typically sodium will move inwards through these leak channels, but they're much less permeable than the potassium channels and, and are less effective at changing the membrane potential. And so they only cause a small movement of ions. You also might have noticed that there was a huge chloride gradient across the membrane um, shown with the squat, giant squid axon. And that's actually established largely by something called the chloride potassium symporter, which actually uh, uses the leakage or, or sort of wantingness of potassium to go out of the cell and piggybacks on that energy transfer. And that's why it's called a symporter because they sort of um, do this. In, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? In synergy, I guess you could say. Um, so without the potassium moving, the chloride ions wouldn't move out. But this establishes a huge gradient. And there's also a, a calcium gradient established largely by a sodium calcium exchanger. So this, similar to our chloride potassium symporter, harnesses the electrochemical forces on sodium. Um, to exchange calcium out of the cell. So every time a sodium ion goes in as it wants to, as we showed up here, the calcium uh, will exchange out using that energetic transfer. And, and these are, again, just a few. You know, there are a lot of different channels, and we hope that 
you know, we get to talk to you guys about more of these channels and how they relate to ultrasound uh, later. Okay, so if there are all of these different channels and all of these different ions and they have different equilibrium potentials, what establishes the neuron's net equilibrium potential? And here I have a simple illustration that I actually borrowed from Steve Backus. Thanks for this, Steve. Uh, so here we're showing the equilibrium potential for potassium with this purple line, um, or at least the relationship between voltage and current. So here you can see that um, as the voltage exceeds negative 70 millivolts, which I told you is the equilibrium, the current of the potassium actually flips and the potassium will start to go into the cell. But anything more positive than negative six, uh, 70 millivolts, the potassium is still uh, being pushed out of the cell. Sodium, which is another major player in the equilibrium potential of a neuron, um, acts very different, differently. So its equilibrium potential is actually around 50 millivolts, so very far away from our potassium channel. So until 50 millivolts is reached, uh, sodium ions will want to move into the cell. And the net equilibrium of the whole system is sort of a weighted balance between all of these different equilibrium potentials, including some others we're not showing in this graphic. But just to keep things simple, we'll just show these two. So uh, again, the resting membrane potential is an average of these. And it's also important to note that it's weighted by the membrane permeability. So you can see here the line's much steeper for potassium. That means that the current changes dramatically with even slight shifts in voltage, whereas the same shift in voltage wouldn't change the current of sodium very much. And this is because the permeability to potassium is much higher than that of sodium. So you'll see that the cell actually looks more like potassium than it does sodium. It's a higher weight, you could say. It's making sense, Kim. Sometimes I'm just rambling. I can't hear myself. And <laughs> It, it is, and, and I can I can feel like we're almost getting to something really useful here about you know keeping them in balance and and then what happens when they go out of balance. Great, yeah, I'm glad you're saying that because we're definitely getting closer. A couple uh, important points to remember is that no you know no single ion is is really at equilibrium when the cell itself is at equilibrium, except maybe chloride ions in some cell types, but we'll ignore that for now. So. All of these are sort of fighting against uh, a potential drive and, and, uh, and ions want to move passively down their electrochemical gradient. But as we mentioned, sodium AT, or, uh, the potassium sodium ATP exchanger is constantly sort of fighting that and creating this gradient. Um, we already mentioned the slope. And, and it's important to, to note that if the sodium potassium ATP exchanger is, is uh, an active mechanism, then if these pumps died, let's say there was no energy left in the cell, then the uh, primary driving force for the electrical gradient would be fulfilled. The, this, these uh, ions would just flow down their, their gradient and the cell would reach essentially a zero uh, equilibrium potential. Mm -hmm. and okay, and so Kim, Kim was already alluding. Sorry, go ahead, Kim. Stuff happens then. Um, if you have a lot of sodium in the cell, then water is going to go into the cell and the cells are going to swell. And that's the basis when people have a stroke and the sodium potassium pumps break. And then um, you can see on diffusion weighted imaging the, where the stroke was because all that water goes into the cell. Um, yeah. And, and it also, uh, this is an outside that's interesting is, you know, think about like when a cell dies, what happens to ATP? So I'll just ask you, Kim, like when a cell dies, what happens? Um, uh, there is none. I mean, it's used up. Right. That's it. So if there's no ATP, then the membrane potential has to move back to zero. And what's interesting is, as we'll show you later, a neuron's active when that actually happens. So when every neuron dies, it becomes active just one more time, which is interesting because as uh, tissue's dying, you might see it start to twitch. Like if there were... I don't know, like it's getting kind of gruesome, but if you had a fish and you started killing it, every single neuron would twitch as the animal was dying and you might see weird spasms. Um, and that might even happen in post-mortem post cadavers sometimes. 
Okay. Anywho. Weird, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a little it's gruesome. I don't know why I went into that. Maybe we'll cut that section out. If a neuron is driven towards equilibrium, how does it activate? So like if it always wants to be, you know, more towards negative 70 or, or 60 millivolts here, you know, what causes it to actually go back into this uh, zero stage is what Kim was asking. Okay, so to get to this, I have to start by telling you about ion channels and even a few other types of channels that aren't ionic. So let's start with the idea of something called a voltage gated ion channel. And I know there's a lot on the slide here, but we'll walk through it um, in, in good time. So first I'm showing you here a sodium voltage gated ion channel. And that what that means is that this particular channel has a gate that is actually activated or sort of uh, swung open and, and again like they're showing a hinge here but in reality it's sort of a molecular hinge right but when there is a positive charge near this uh, this inside then this gate will swing open and that will allow sodium to come into the cell down its uh, electrochemical gradient and following this conduction this uh, pore is actually blocked so it stops conducting uh, very rapidly. And even if there's an electrochemical gradient, nothing happens until that pore swings back. So this becomes important uh, later in something called an action potential. Potassium uh, also has its own voltage gated channels. They're a little bit different. So in this case, again, when there is a positive charge uh, established on the inside, these pores open up and potassium is allowed to flow out of the cell down its own electrochemical gradient, which you should note is different from sodium. That will come up later. But in this potassium uh, voltage gated channel, there's really no inactivation mechanism. It's either just on or it's off. So it's a very quick acting, uh, or not quick acting, but it's a very simple sort of mechanism. And in fact, I said quick, but these interactions, these molecular interactions are actually much slower than the activation of sodium channels. Um, and people have quantified these speeds. Yeah. How fast are we talking? Are, are we talking milliseconds? We're, we're talking like, uh, so I would say the sodium channel is like sub milliseconds, but maybe a few milliseconds. And the potassium channel, I think this gating occurs on the order of several milliseconds. We're going to find out there's one there's a slide on that so let's actually take a look and try to figure it out um, but before we do that there are a few other channel types so uh, as i mentioned these are gated by voltage sensing because the voltage will pull on these little molecular gates um, there are also ligand gated ion channels so in this case there's actually a molecule that like will float in from let's say a neighboring neuron and bind to a particular site on the ion channel. They'll usually call this like an activation site or a receptor. And the binding ca causes a conformational shift. Like it sort of molecularly bends the channel and opens it up. And then depending on whatever channel you have here, ions may flow uh, down their electrochemical gradient. So there are also intracellular ligand gated uh, molecules. I guess the, differ the differentiating factor here is that here the ligands came from the outside of the cell, but the cell can also sort of trigger its own uh, excitability. So here, and we're gonna bring this up in just a moment, a neurotransmitter signals a molecule and some sort of chemical interaction occurs inside the cell. And now you're actually opening or closing this channel based on intracellular uh, messaging. And we'll get to a little bit more on that later. And, and a very important channel for this course is the mechanically gated ion channel. So I'm going to show you a little bit on conventional theory about how these things work. But Kim and I are really excited about new theories on how these channels work and how we think those are, well, for one, maybe more accurate uh, representations of what's happening, but two, how well they work with ultrasound. And the idea here is that you have these channels and somehow when a force is exerted on a membrane, so I haven't drawn yet, let me try that out. Let's say we have a force pushing on this membrane 
and it somehow bends, and this can be illustrated by this figure here, then these channels uh, essentially open up and allow for ions to flow across. And what's misleading here, and you'll see this in every textbook, is that the lipids are bending and almost pulling on one side of the channel versus the other. And I simply do not really have a strong conviction for that actually happening anymore. Um, and similar models have been made where these little channel bits were actually tethered to uh, intracellular or extracellular membrane components. So if you guys have heard of actin cytoskeleton, imagine like a tether to this channel. And when you move the cell around, if they're tethered, you're gonna be pulling on that channel in all kinds of weird ways. Um, I also don't know that that has a huge role either. Um, and what's not displayed here that's really exciting is that the uh, force may actually be sensed by the membrane itself. So again, let me go back to, to draw here. So the force may be sensed here and may actually mix up little enzymes. Let's say there's enzyme A here and enzyme B. This is a really terrible drawing. But because this membrane is morphing, these are now interacting with each other and sending a chemical messenger over to our channel here and opening it up as we had seen before. So now that this ion travels through. So conventional thinking is that these are mechanically gated, but really they may actually be ligand gated while the membrane itself is a mechano sensor that, uh, that performs this ligand gating. So really confusing. I know there's a lot of stuff going on here, but I, I want you guys to know what Kim and I are really excited about and, and what we're going to talk about in a few lectures later on. One thing uh, I'm confused about, Keith, while you're right, go ahead, your, you're going to erase your little annotations right there is. Oh, good call. Um, how come this is, is, it sounds like you're saying this is a little bit of a question as to how these work, but isn't this well known how these work? No, it's, well, okay. So if I were, let's say I were really deep in the field, which I'm only peripherally re related to the field, um, I would get a lot of pushback. This is one of those fields that, has been around forever and and there's like always a little bit of evidence to say oh this is maybe what happens but if you dig deep enough there's always questions that arise like is there actually enough force connection between the lipid membrane and these channels to pull them apart from each other you know is is this arrow here stronger than the force that binds the internal pocket and Scott Hansen over at Scripps is a close friend of, of Kim and I's, and um, he's been sort of overturning a lot of this conventional theory and saying that it's not enough and that probably mechanical channels are really like ligand gated channels. And um, I'll just give a shout out to Craig Montel too, who often shows that mechano sensors are also chemical sensors. Really cool example. I'm, I'm going on here, but think about burn and chili peppers and things like that, or capsaicin or wasabi. So why is it that a molecule creates a burning sensation in our mouths when burning sensation should come from mechanical displacement from temperature, right? Like that's the conventional thinking. So it, it turns out that mechanically gated channels are also ligand gated by um, things like capsaicin, which are found in chilies. So I'm going on here. I'm really excited about it, but I think I think we're going to come back to this more. Oh, Thoughts, Kim? Yeah. Too far. I'm going too far. I'm going to go on to the next thing. Okay. <laughs> Metabotropic uh, receptors are just sort of another version um, that we kind of talked about. These are compared to our original. Oops, let me erase this a little bit here. Compared to our original ion channels that receive ligands. These uh, simply receive the ligand, but do not uh, involve the conductance of any ions. So there's no, there's no change in electrical flow here, but rather they cause these internal signaling pathways, basically enzymes acting on other enzymes. Um, you know, I, I won't get into these pathways. There are many of them. But in, in this case, you're getting a secondary messenger molecule, which phosphorylates or transfers energy to a potassium channel and, and basically opens the gate. So even though there's no ion flow here, the secondary messaging uh, 
system indirectly opens another ion channel. And again, these are called metabotropic receptors. And as shown by this sort of voltmeter schematic, they're a little bit slower than your traditional ionic currents, but they can be just as strong, if not stronger. And are you going to be telling us that mechanical effects can um, can affect those? The me- yeah. You know, I've never seen, I, I'm sure there's stuff out there. I've never seen mechanosensory metabotropic receptors. Okay. Which, given what I've told you, you'd almost expect like maybe more of them because they have these internal signaling cascades let's let's uh let's make that a homework maybe for the students and and ourselves let's look and see if if those exist and why it's a good question okay so here's here's the sort of fun part of putting all of these pieces together and saying what does an active neuron look like and i'm going to walk you through these steps so i i've already kind of shown how the cell reaches this um, negative 70 millivolts at rest um, by sort of balancing these different equilibrium potentials. Um, and I've told you that a cell becomes active when the neuron actually loses this charge. So when it starts to go into this zero voltage territory, and I'll tell you why that means a cell's active later, but for now, you know, how does it get there? So again, we know why the cell is at, at this negative 70 millivolts. Um, And now we've shown you that the cell can actually sense different molecules or voltages to get these little uh, initial bumps in this voltage. Um, And what's interesting here is that there's actually a threshold point. So let's just say in one case, a few different molecules have hit a metabotropic receptor and caused a small amount of conductance. So let's say a small amount of sodium has entered the cell. So the membrane potential rises a little bit, right? But it hasn't reached the thresholds. And the threshold here is actually the voltage at which these voltage-gated sodium channels begin to open up. So when these uh, voltage-gated sodium channels open up, there's a huge further influx of even more sodium. So it's sort of a self-feeding system that rapidly drives the cell into this positive territory. And this self-feeding system is called an action potential. So it's sort of an active process of the cell. Um, And and again, you can have sub-threshold, basically changes in potential that don't engage these voltage sensors. And the repolarization of the cell, so the cell returning back to its resting state is actually caused by potassium voltage-gated channels that are slower. And I think I have a diagram here So a similar thing on the right, where VM represents the voltage of the membrane in its entirety. And here you can see that the sodium voltage-gated channels are quickly activated um, in in response to about 50 millivolts. So you can see when 50 millivolts is hit, these rapidly come on. I guess 50 millivolts is hit right here. Maybe I'll get out my handy uh, drawing tool. So here's where we hit about 50 millivolts and you can see sodium channels come on fast. Kim, you had asked how fast. So we can look at our bottom here and look to the peak. It's about, I would say, 0.3 milliseconds. If you agree with that. And I told you the reason that the cell can rise rapidly and then depolarize after is because these have different speeds. So the sodium channels rapidly open up and as I mentioned before, at some point, the activation gate swing shuts. So, so even if the voltage wants potassium or sodium channel ions to flow in, the gate is shut and they stop doing that. Whereas at this point, the potassium channels have opened up in response to voltage and potassium ions are flowing uh, back out of the cell and trying to drive this uh, membrane voltage back down. And in fact... Sorry, go ahead, Kim. When you are referring to sodium channels and potassium channels, so you're not referring to the sodium potassium pumps. No, so those those are really responsible here um, and will continue to be active throughout this process. But these two voltage-gated channels are so powerful that when they become active, their effects are seen very quickly and, and strongly. Okay, so those are completely separate channels and it's only sodium in the sodium channels and only potassium in the 
potassium channels. Is that right? Mm -hmm. That's right. So these are considered highly selective channels. Okay. And I, so I'll jump back in because the speeds are different. These potassium channels, the voltage gated are open for a long, long time. And this actually causes the membrane voltage to overshoot, to actually go below what the cell wants to do with all of these equilibriums. So it actually takes um, a few milliseconds more for the cell to return to its resting uh, potential. And I didn't show this here, but it's important to note that when a cell is hyperpolarized or below its resting membrane potential, it's actually less excitable than where we started over here on the left-hand side. So this is known often as a refractory period, and it's very difficult to excite a neuron rapidly in succession unless you're you know, back to resting membrane potential. And Kim and I have some simulation tools we might show to the class later uh, that, that allow you to see these things in action. Oh, actually it says on the left-hand side, a refractory period resting state. So you can see all these, these terms in action. Okay, so I won't belabor that point anymore. Um, I'll get to another important set of ideas here in, oh, let me erase this. So I keep talking about all these membrane voltages and positive means yes, and, and the negative charge inside means the cell's not active. Um, and we're getting close to signal communication, but there's a few more bits first. So uh, a neuron needs to send information across its membrane. So it needs to send it out to the rest of the cell so that information can go from the dendrites or the receivers to the axon or the output. And one way that this information travels is by something called a graded potential. So this is the passive conductance of ions across a membrane. And if we look at this diagram here and we say, okay, a cell's become sort of activated and that now there's this positive charge inside the membrane representing that activation, that positive charge will spread out across this membrane, but that positive charge, because it's spreading, becomes weaker over space. So it's most positive near the site of activation, near the channel bundle, and less positive as you move laterally. So information, it would be impossible to communicate between cells just with these graded potentials because they diffuse or they, they grow weak so quickly, right? So, uh, so that's where we have to start thinking about an action potential um, actually propagating across a membrane. So an action potential, the word, while used sort of loosely in the field, refers to the idea that if enough of this graded potential shown here spreads out to another site where there are voltage-gated channels, that those voltage-gated channels will trigger sort of a, a reinvigoration of that positive charge. So here you can see it's gone from this section and just enough has triggered this section to uh, create this voltage swing. So this sec section has been activated as well. And some people might ask, well, like, so would this now spread backwards and forwards? Because again, we have graded potentials going both directions shown here. But you have to remember, as we showed in this slide, there's a refractory period following an action potential. And this will actually block the cell signal from flowing backwards. So this is a mechanism by which information can travel unidirectionally down a cell membrane. It's really interesting stuff. Um, there are caveats. Sometimes back potentials can happen um, if you have some sort of weird temporal effects, but we, we won't talk about those here. So it's also important to notice that, um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm almost like lying to you a little bit here because this sort of shows as if there's always voltage-gated sodium channels ready to go right next to our graded potentials. And if that were the case, then any little action potential locally should always propagate throughout the whole cell. But that doesn't happen. I mean, there, it simply can't, or else information would never be selected for or against or integrated. So the truth is um, that the cell looks more like uh, a little patchy bundle of different channels. So here we can see voltage-gated sodium channels in red, and you can see that in this illustration of a, a neuron membrane, you know, they're really sparse. They're not all right next to each other. Um, and that actually allows information loss to happen or aggregation to reach a certain threshold. 
So as we mentioned earlier, there's this axon initial segment, um, sometimes referred to as the axon hillock, which uh, has a very high density of these voltage gated uh, channels. Some papers report up to 50 fold greater than any other area. So this acts as sort of a highly sensitive integrator of both graded and active potentials from the rest of the neuron. And what's interesting is that even though there aren't so many sodium, uh, or sorry, voltage gated sodium channels along the axon, see how they're very far apart from each other, that uh, a signal can still propagate very quickly and um, reliably down an axon. And I'll talk about how that happens now. So let's, let's start by saying um, the propagation of action potentials is dependent on something called the length constant. And the length constant is essentially used, it's a formula to quantify the distance that a graded potential will travel along a neurite or a neural structure before it's degraded um, by a certain amount. So in this formula here, uh, the length constant represented on the left is heavily dependent on membrane resistance, which is shown by RM here, and axial resistance, which is shown by RI here. So axial resistance um, is very much, I think we have it hit, written here, controlled by how large the neurite is. So as cable theory sort of states, the larger the internal surface area, the easier a charge can flow down that neurite. So that leads to less axial resistance uh, or a smaller value for RI here. The RO is sort of the outer axial resistance, which is virtually negligible in most neurons. So we usually ignore that, that constant here or uh, that factor here. And, and uh, the membrane resistance is something to note about it is that this will actually decrease with more channel opening or ion flow across a membrane. Uh, so without, you know, without any intervention, a membrane, a membrane de uh, depolarization voltage doesn't go very far. It only goes between like 0.1 and 5 millimeters. You know, that wouldn't be enough to get down most axons in the brain, which, or, or, you know, these smaller amounts might not be enough. So how do we propagate a voltage across really large distances, like something in the spinal cord or the sciatic nerve? Um, how do we have these travel fast and reliably? Okay, so there are uh, glial cells that act on that membrane resistance. So again, how do we increase this membrane resistance value to allow better conduction and a larger length constant? So slower degradation of signal. And Schwann cells, which are a type of oligodendrocyte, which I showed you earlier, they're one of our glial types, glial cell types, are these sort of waxy, lipid heavy um, glial cells that coil around, a, let's say, a cross section of an axon here. And again, this increases the membrane resistance because the waxiness of this cell and the, the dense sort of coiling around heavily limits the amount of ionic flow across the membrane. In fact, if you can see here, these, these myelin sheets, as they're called, these wrapping coils, you know, there's really no way that ions would flow into this waxy area. So um, essentially you can imagine if to, well, we'll look at this bottom figure, if a voltage, uh, a voltage gated event or an action potential happens between these nodes or between these wrapped up areas, a graded potential can spread very, very fast and very well in these myelinated areas without degrading, which would commonly happen in something like a dendrite where there is no uh, sheathing or wrapping. In these inner sites where the action potential can regenerate because of the high density of sodium channels that we showed you, these are typically called the nodes of Ranvier. Um, and again, these allow for recharging. Okay, so we're starting to get very, very close to signal transmission. I think things are coming together a little bit here. Um, I just wanted to talk about how the neuron first integrates information before it sends it out. And now we know that once information reaches the axon and the myelinated part of the cell, it's gonna travel very well. Um, you know, it's basically all or nothing. It's a go sign in this region and it just sends it out. But prior to that, in the dendrite and the soma, there's a lot of questionable signals that come in. So 
So there may be a, let's say a positive signal from A. In fact, let's, let's sort of jump over to these, these uh, additional items to the right. So there's something called uh, temporal summation. So let's say for instance, as shown here, that there's a slight depolarization of the membrane at site A. So you get this little bump in membrane voltage and that it happens spaced out enough that you know, we never quite reach uh, this action potential site down at the uh, axon initial segment or axon hillock. But if you have two pulses that are very close from site A in time, that the sum of these overlaid might start to reach that, um, that uh, voltage gated sort of threshold here at the axon hillock. And that now this signal is gonna propagate. And again, because of all the myelination and the heavy uh, sodium or, or voltage gated sodium channels, the signal will propagate very reliably. So one of them is temporal, where the timing of an input is very important, and the other is spatial. So let's say we have two different inputs that are at different sites in the cell, um, and they are traveling across the membrane, you know, to, to meet each other in time at this site. And here that's demonstrated that you have both A and B coming from different sites, and you may even have an inhibitory site sort of weighing into this uh, multiplicative uh, system where that actually lowers the membrane potential. Um, but basically when you sum all these up, the question is, did it reach threshold and did it trigger the sending of this charge down the membrane? So temporal and spatial summation of signals is the way that the neuron really integrates and makes decisions about whether or not the neuron should fire. Okay, so let's get down to uh, sort of the culmination of all of these things. So we've integrated a signal, we've reached a threshold in the axon, axon initial segment, and this charge has propagated down the membrane no matter how far away because myelin sheaths hold it in so well. Now we reach the interface between uh, the dendrites of a postsynaptic cell, and I'm calling it a postsynaptic neuron because this region is called the synapse. And again, we have a presynaptic neuron here. So we can imagine our um, charge has traveled all the way into this synaptic site. Um, and and you know, what happens here? How is information actually transferred across these two neurons? And what happens is that in these presynaptic sites, there are more voltage-gated uh, channels, except this time they're called calcium uh, voltage-gated channels. And these, when the voltage becomes sufficiently positive, will allow huge influxes of calcium. And what happens then is that these vesicles or these other little lipid membranes holding certain signaling molecules, which we'll talk about in a moment, um, are actually uh, helped sort of in infusing to the membrane. Uh, I think we have an a further illustration of this. So again, the, the the voltage has become positive, calcium flows in and binds to these vesicles, and that actually helps them fuse to the membrane and release these molecules towards the postsynaptic cell. And the postsynaptic cell may have a bunch of those receptor types that we talked about earlier, um, like a metabotropic receptor, and, and this would be the metabolite, or uh, it could be an ion channel and, and an ion channel, channel signaling molecule. This would be such a great time to maybe bring up the concept of GCAMP imaging. Sure. Do you want to bring that? Do you want to tell them about it? Or oh, you go ahead. <laughs> yeah. So later we're going to talk about a way to measure whether or not a neuron is active. And an incredible tool that was developed almost by accident is a, a protein that was synthesized that binds calcium. And when it binds calcium, it actually becomes sort of fluorescently uh, available. So if we shine a blue light at it, it will fluoresce green back only in the presence of calcium. And because I just showed you that the presence of calcium indicates that vesicle fusion is happening and communication is happening, then the presence of calcium is actually a pretty good indicator of neural activity, like we would all agree. So fluorescence, because of the calcium equals neural activity indication. 
and Kim and I both use that in our in our respective laboratories. Um, and and uh, it's a really amazing tool that is going to come up over and over again. Did I miss anything with that, Kim? No, that's perfect. Um, but while we're at the synapse, maybe just remind us again what the um, astrocyte does in the tripartite synapse. Sure. So um, I guess as these uh, calcium deposits are being sort of absorbed by the cell, uh, many of them may become sort of fused or play a role within the neuron or even buffered by the cell here itself. So how does the cell uh, basically continue to maintain a healthy concentration of calcium? One of the roles of astrocytes is actually to sort of balance out that calcium or buffer it. And another one is, well, once these um, molecules have been uh, basically bound to their receptors, uh, how, how, do they, how do they stop doing this? And like, how do we you know, stop signaling from happening? And these tripartite glial cells that are to the side may actually take these molecules in and sort of reform them and recharge them and send them back into the presynaptic cell. The functions are very diverse first too. So there's, there's a lot of things I'm not talking about here. So the astrocytes really involved with sort of resetting the synapse. Yeah, that's a, a really good way to look at it. Is there any way that the astrocyte can start an action potential or it's just about buffering and resetting? I, I, I'd be, I'm sure you could find papers where glial or astrocytes in the tripartite release uh, neuromodulators, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, I don't think they really play a huge role in actually activating the neuron, unless there's something you know that you were getting at. <laughs> Did you have some something you wanted to? No, no. So that's so that's mostly about um, sort of resetting the synapse. Okay. Yeah. Well, the, and again, the neuromodulation is that it can bias how well the cell responds. So, like for instance, you could block the neurotrans, let's call this the neurotransmitter. Mm -hmm. If you block the uptake by the astrocyte or by the cell itself, then you're increasing the amount of response in the postsynaptic cell because this molecule continues to bind. So it sort of can activate a cell just indirectly, mm -hmm. which the term neuromodulation really means, but we haven't gotten there yet. Maybe you know it from a, a former course. I don't know. Anywho. Um, Oh, just to, to further flesh this out is it's a little bit cryptic how calcium helps this view. So let me just show you a deeper diagram. So we have these uh, neurotransmitter vesicles, let's call them. And, it, and to jump ahead, a neurotransmitter is one of those signaling molecules I mentioned earlier. So a ligand gated channel. What is the ligand? The ligand might be a neurotransmitter, um, which affects the cell's excitability. But for release, those need to be packaged in this bilipid membrane, almost like a micro cell or a housing where there might be a bunch of those little molecules inside here. And there are these other sort of anchoring, extending extracellular proteins called synaptobrevin and synaptotagmin. And on the cell's membrane, there's even more proteins called SNAP25 and syntaxin. And there's this molecular complex that will randomly form between these two tethers and the tethers of the membrane. So no matter what, the cell is constantly flipping in between a state of sort of interaction and floating around in the cell, right? But calcium does this really awesome thing. It actually allows these complexes to bind extremely tight. So without calcium, this might just float back off. But with calcium, it squeezes so tight that these membranes that look very similar actually start to fuse together. So here you can see the fusion process sort of taking place all the way up to the point where a pore is formed between the outside of the cell here and the vesicle holding pool. And eventually they just kind of dump out into the uh, synaptic space. And I believe I have, okay, so, so that's how we release them. And once they're you know, sort of released, how do we recharge or create more vesicles so that the cell can do this again? Because the cell needs to fire maybe 10 or 100 times a second. And the way that that happens is by a molecule called clathrin. So these are clathrin dependent endocytosis. And in this diagram, that molecule is shown by green here. 
these are essentially proteins that link to one another, but also to the cell membrane. And as they start to link, they develop these internal tensions, almost like a shrinking uh, plastic in a microwave or something. And as they shrink, they start to pinch the membrane in. Um, and at some point, it, you know, it looks like a budding head, but how do you actually snap off this and create a sort of vesicle? And that happens from this molecule it's called dynamin, which actually has an affinity to wrap around um, these non uh sections and pinch the molecule such that we now have a whole new vesicle. And then there are these other channels uh, called molecular transporters that will bring our signaling molecules back into these cells. It's, it's really complex, but I just want to give you an overview of how that might happen. Okay, neurotransmitters, I kept talking a lot about them. I just have a, a lot of written text here, but the definition of a neurotransmitter, and I, I showed pictures of them at the chemical synapse, is a chemical that's released at the end of a nerve, nerve fiber that really directly allows an action potential. So it, it fuses directly across the membrane, it reaches that postsynaptic partner and causes that cell to uh, eventually fire or depolarize or have its own you know, action potential. And that distinction you know, is important right now. And some of the properties that make neurotransmitters different from a one another are what their receptors are and how tightly they bind. So it's important to know that one neurotransmitter uh, might not have a single receptor, but many, um, where they're found in the brain. Um, so one instance here is uh, glutamate, which I'll talk about. It's found all over the brain um, and it can act in many different ways on many different receptors. Uh, what are the charges, size, molecular makeup, and whether or not they're typically associated with a negative ion current or a positive. So do they inhibit or excite the cell? Um, and what behavior they might be associated with. So like people always talk about serotonin as like a happy molecule, you know, the, the associated behavior might be positive valence there. Uh, okay, so one very popular example of a neurotransmitter that you'll hear a lot about is glutamate. And the reason you hear so much about it is because it is the dominant signaling molecule in the brain. It's found really everywhere. And again, we'll come back to that, that visual that we showed. Here's glutamate inside a glutamatergic vesicle fusing with the membrane and coming into this uh, synaptic space. And in this case, you can see that there's not just one receptor, but actually three different types of receptors that all have their own special property. So I'll just briefly say that there's the AMPA receptor, um, which modulates cell excitability by gating the flow of calcium and sodium. So we know that these are positive ions that are uh, largely outside of the cell, but during excitation flow into the cell. So AMPA is a largely an excitatory receptor. There's also similar receptors called kinate receptors, which are permeable to sodium and potassium. Uh, so these are, you know, a little bit interesting because again, potassium wants to flow out of the neuron, but, but they can have modulatory effects as well. And there's also the N-methyl D aspartate receptor which is a non-selective cation channel, which would ultimately lead to membrane depolarization. Um, the NMDA receptor is really interesting because it normally has a magnesium uh, plus two ion blocking it. So like, even if it's a non-selective cation channel, even if it you know, wants to have sodium flow through, magnesium is actually blocking that from happening, even if it's activated by NMDA released or by glutamate released, I should say. Um, but what's interesting is that if you have a strong enough depolarization in the membrane, so if there's enough of a positive charge shown here, the magnesium will actually be pushed away. So that positive two will be pushed away from the positive charge that will unblock the pore. So now this channel can become active. So these are often referred to as coincidence detectors because they're strongly activating, but only when other events are happening in the same neuron. So these are almost like uh, many inputs need to become need to be coming into the cell, and if they are coming in at the same time, then the neuron has this strong NMDA response, um, NMDA receptor response. And this plays a huge role in learning and memory and and neuronal selectivity to multiple inputs. 
Uh, GABA is another one you'll hear a lot about. So I'll, I'll sort of skip forward to the idea that GABA is interesting because it's actually a, a, a metabolic downstream product of glutamate itself. So an enzyme actually creates GABA and it has its own little vesicles. And what's interesting is most of the GABA uh, ligand receptors actually conduct chloride. And we know that chloride concentrations are very high outside of the cell. So when this channel is open, it wants to flow in. And that further makes the inside of the membrane negative, which now I'm hoping you know will make the cell less excitable because the membrane now has a stronger negative charge. It's interesting though, GABA receptors don't always conduct chloride. So in, in fewer cases, they're actually conductive of sodium. So there's diverse outcomes depending on which receptor GABA is targeting, but typically they perform on the way uh, of the left hand side here. Okay, so I'm, I really want to beat home diversity because diversity and heterogeneity is one of the really exciting things about neuroscience. It's also really one of the confusing things. So within the brain, there's this region called the ventral tegmental area, uh, very deep in the brain. And nicotine is involved in engaging um, dopaminergic neurons here through a nicot nicotinamide uh, sensitive uh, cell type. But what's cool here is that two, cell, two cells that are both dopaminergic and both receive nic uh, nicotine in similar parts of the brain may either increase their spiking. So here you can see action potentials happening much faster after the application of nicotine. And here you can see the ni nicotine applied to the very you know, similar area, you get much less spiking. So like, why does that kind of thing happen? And if you look closely at the cells and which ones are inhibited versus excited, they're very closely bundled together. Um, and, and it actually turns out that these uh, red cells have a D2 type receptor, which uh, coincidentally changes the valence of the nicotine, um, basically the nicotine outcome on the cells. And the paper doesn't figure out how that happens, but I just wanted to highlight the point that subtle differences in receptor expression between two cells that otherwise look really similar can change the outcome on these neurons entirely. And Kim's really, you know, I hope she's excited by this because it comes into play a lot with ultrasound. So slightly different expression profiles across two cells that otherwise, you know, both look like neurons may change what they do in response to ultrasound. And this, you know, this crosses over many domains of neuromodulation. And I just used the word neuromodulation. What does that word even mean? You know, I, I've been talking about neurotransmission where one cell directly activates the cell right next to it. But neuromodulation is another form of signaling in the brain. And neuro a neuromodulator is a chemical messenger that's released from a neuron or a gland or something into the central nervous system or even the periphery that spreads out over a huge amount of space and sort of tweaks the resting membrane potential of a neuron, but doesn't explicitly sort of activate it per se. So you can think of it as like opening up a potassium channel, a leak channel, just a little bit more. So that might inhibit, that might modulate in a negative direction. Um, and, and that increases or decreases the possibility that a neurotransmitter can do its job. But again, these don't usually act directly on ion channels, so they don't cause ion channel flow. Um, and some examples of these might include hormones like cholecystokinin, which has diverse effects all across the nervous, uh, nervous system, but um, is actually produced in the gut mostly and gets into the brain. So it's that gut-brain interaction I talked about earlier plays a role here. And it actually moves through the bloodstream. Um, there's also neuropeptides, which you may hear a lot about, like uh, opioid neuropeptides, neuropeptide Y, substance P, and these typically act through uh, ligand metabotropic receptors known as GPCRs. Um, and molecules typically classified as neurotransmitters may actually go outside of their, their little synaptic domain and may act weakly on cells that aren't close by through GPCRs or through non-ion channels. So uh, if you haven't, you know, if, if you don't take away anything uh, from this whole lecture, the one thing you should take home is that 
there's so many complicated interactions across these neurons. There's many ways that neurons can signal each other. And, and uh, you know, this is just sort of a, a brief view at, at, at that. Um, we're happy to talk about more throughout the course. Uh, so, you know, here's, here's a visual to compare these. Neurotransmission should be thought about as a local passage of information, as I said. Sorry to say it again, but maybe it is important. Whereas neuromodulation, shown on the right here, is really the spread of molecules across and between synapse and throughout the brain, um, just tuning of the network. So, Kim, I guess I could ask, we always use the word ultrasound neuromodulation, but would you, after hearing that, would you think that, you know, ultrasound's a neuromodulator or, you know, sort of a direct transmission uh, line into a neuron? Oh, you're muted, Kim. <laughs> I'm not sure because I'm not sure we really talked about it enough. So, oh, maybe we don't want to ruin the secret. We will no, get to that. Actually, I'm not sure. You know what? I won't even say any more. But this is an exciting thing we will come back to that I have opinions on, and, and I'm, I hope that everyone here has opinions. Okay, so that's that's the end of the lecture. But as you know, we're going to get into a lot more that has to deal with ultrasound and its interaction with you know, the membrane and channels, which I hope that you have a better sort of grip on after this. We'll go into a lot of mechanosensitive channels. Kim mentioned GCAMP, how do you record neural activity that we talked about today? Um, and all sorts of model systems and thera therapeutic applications that, that sort of integrate a lot of these first few lectures. And I hope that that was informative. And I'm out of breath, I just talked a lot. Kim, any, any uh, thoughts on the upcoming lectures? <laughs> Well, our next lecture is going to be on pressure waves, and so um, our challenge will be not to not, not necessarily understanding pressure waves, but coming back together after that one, and how do pressure waves and you know mechanical stimuli interact with the brain, and trying to get that across in subsequent lectures. So that's great, and I think we'll have a lot from uh, some labs here at Stanford, like. Uh, Merritt's lab and, and Steve's lab who, who researched that stuff very directly and your own lab, I guess. Anyway. All right. Well, good. All right. Let's just, let's call it a day then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sounds good.